from idea to release was how long? About 10 years. Okay, and Deadpool 1 or Deadpool 2 green light to release about a year? Uh, yeah, well, uh, I mean, they green lit us, you know, about a week before it released. You know, they had an idea it was right. going to do pretty well, and then, and then they, yeah, they, so they gave us the green light. So we were kind of, but on the set we were talking about stuff. I mean, that scene in, where Cable is in the backseat of the cab and Deadpool accuses him of being racist and stuff, like we were writing that on the set of Deadpool 1, just sort of as a, as a lark. But um, so little, little bits and pieces were already sort of conceived earlier. So at what point do you settle on a story? I mean, is it something where you come up with a character, with a plot? I mean, what are the what are the building blocks? You have such a long time in the first film to establish the world. When you're coming back to the sequel, you've established the world. Where do you start in terms of the next idea? Well, I mean, I talked about it in jest, but we really did want Deadpool in the second movie to find a family. In the first movie, he finds romance. And in the second movie, he was going to find a family by the end of the movie, that family being the dysfunctional X-Force. So we kind of backed our way into that. I know that sounds strange, but we knew where we were headed, and then it was just about finding the map to get us there. And what about this idea that Deadpool is probably his most effective as a character when he's in some sort of pain? That what you kind of keep coming back to is humanizing Deadpool and having him not suffer, but having him be vulnerable. How do you make sure that that's a recurrent idea? And how do you make sure that you're presenting in a way that doesn't feel unearned? I always just feel that, you know, Deadpool needs to be in some kind of, you know, extreme psychic distress in order to be palatable. I mean, the guy's so obnoxious and just so <laughs> over the top. I mean, you know, if you don't put him in a position of, of taking everything away from him and putting him in a position of being the underdog, I don't, I don't know how it would really work. You know, I mean, he's a guy who's covered head to toe in scars. I mean, you know, he's not living Oprah's best life every day. He's like, you know, he's a, he's, he's a guy that's like got a, he carries around a, a pretty significant bag of rocks each day. So that helps. I mean, that helps everything that we want to accomplish in the movie. It helps us get away with a lot of stuff that you know you'd never get away with if you just were, you know. Uh, Superhero, typical superhero in a spandex and you know with a, a casually tossed hair and a spray tan. I think it also makes Deadpool very relatable. It makes Wade Wilson very relatable to the audience. You know, he's guy he's suffering from all. You know, the world just kicked him in the nuts and keeps kicking him in the nuts. And I think we can all relate to that. You know, especially in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> when you're making a movie at say Disney, you have a huge repository of Marvel characters. Fox, not so much. When you're thinking about the Marvel characters that you can use, how do you figure out who you want to bring in, who you're going to create, who you're going to tap, and how do you make sure that they're the right fit for the story? Well, we wanted to kill all the Avengers, but they're doing it themselves. So, you know, no, I, I love I love the Avengers. I love everything Marvel does. I, I love that we, Fox, we have a different stable of characters we get to use. I actually love that these we, we find these really deep, deep cut ancillary characters like Negasonic Teenage Warhead, who like appears in, in half a comic like 10 years ago, but we just love the name and love the sort of idea behind her. And, uh, so, you know, I like that. I like that stuff. Again, necessity is a mother invention. So if you're finding these characters that aren't necessarily like the A Squad X Men guys, it sort of works in a weird way, it works in Deadpool's favor. At what point do you start talking about um, how this story is going to be presented cinematically? At what point does David Leach, your director, become part of the conversation? And have you written very specifically, like, this is going to be a takeoff on the AHA music video? How much is he interpreting those scenes, and how much are, are you guys working collaboratively to make sure that he can bring a visual language to what you've written on the page? I mean, I, I, you know, Dave is one of those guys that just, if he doesn't know how to do something, he'll just will it there. He just works so hard. He just works harder than everyone else in the room, and that's, that's something that I think is why he's been so successful so far. But I mean... Yeah, there's like the aha stuff. I mean, like that was actually initially conceived as an opening to the movie a long time ago. We had a, an opening dance number to the whole film where, um, I don't know if everyone, anyone saw the Celine Dion music video to Ashes, but there's like, yeah. a, there's this incredible guy who's a dancer named Giannis Marshall and I, I had found him on Instagram because I wanted to use him for the opening of Deadpool. I wanted it to be very obvious that it was like not 
really Deadpool dancing or me dancing underneath the suit. So we wanted to do the sequence at the beginning where it was where Deadpool's dancing and you know he's actually there's the whole apartment that he's in that he and Vanessa shared together is slowly blowing up while he's dancing. But it's like this really beautiful dance, but it's also kind of something's really very disturbing about it. We don't know why, and at the end you see that he's trying to kill himself, and that's sort of the opening of the movie. But it turned out to be just too expensive, so we we sort of trashed it. But then the Aha song sort of re reappeared at the end of the movie in, in a great way. So. When you are thinking about time travel as a plot device, it opens up a huge can. Do it, it's the worst. worst. So why did you choose to do it? What does it give you narratively, and what traps does it set? Because, and I think there, there actually was a, I think it's on the DVD where Deadpool visits baby Hitler, is that right? Yes, he does pay a visit to Little Hitler. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it presents well. It presents that problem uh, for starters. Uh, there, there, it, it presents a whole host of issues. I mean, you, you know, you could sit there for days and go, wait. Oh, so at the end of this movie, you're, you can sit there and think, like, wait, was all this for naught? Like, I don't understand. You went back and you sort of does he did Green Lantern even happen now? Like, I don't. I need to know. It happened, Brian. It happened. <laughs> it did. It sure did. Oh, I was there for. I think a year and a half. I think it was a Sunday. No, it was an old W.C. Fields joke. Really. Um, someone on the internet will be like, he stole that joke from W.C. Fields. Um, yeah, yes. Yeah, screen. Thank you, Paul. And fuck you. <laughs> but how do you make sure that you don't do exactly what, I'm, that, what you're saying? How do you make sure that you, you are obeying your own rules? You say no. Okay. I mean, that's... Oh, what are you talking about? Um, oh, the, the time travel thing. The time travel thing. Yeah. Now, how do you make sure that it works for the story? You know, obviously, you can become overly intellectual about the rules and what is and is not happening. Well, I mean, you have to try to plug every hole in the dive that you can. You know, and, but knowing that at the end of the day, it's not entirely going to add up. You just have to let that go, and and then sometimes point at it. We always have that that strategy where if, if, if something's stupid, we just have someone in the movie say, that's stupid. Like, and, and, it's, it's, uh, there's a line in the movie where Deadpool says, well, that's just lazy writing. And that is actually a, the perfect example of lazy writing right there. It's, that's lazy writing. Uh, yeah, yeah. Tell us about, don't do try and travel movies. It's really uh, your cast of superheroes and about their special skills and about that sequence, how early did that come into the writing process? How do you decide how that scene was going to unfold and what people's skills were and whether or not Luck was actually a superpower? Well, that's an entirely um, cuttable scene, sequence in the movie, but it's something that doesn't necessarily need to be in the movie, but we found that we just needed a bit of a break before the convoy. So we were thinking, what, what would be funny? And I remember we were all sitting around pitching this idea that what if, you know, Wade assembles like the actual X-Force, real characters that we know, and we sort of even do standees in theaters of them all. We really find some way to shut this down and make sure that nothing leaks. And then the, the initial pitch was, okay, then they'll all jump out of a plane, except they all land in a minefield. And like one by one, each of them just explodes. And then we're like, what the fuck is a minefield doing in the middle of a city? Like, this isn't, <laughs> you know... <laughs> This is in the 1940s or something. It's, it just doesn't make any sense. So then it's turned into this sort of Rube Goldberg type device where we just thought it was really fun to just sort of see one by one go and sort of live in Deadpool's reaction to each of these. And it's also like this wish fulfillment. He wants a family and he feels like he's finally got it. And then like one by one, they each, each of them die. And like it was just... I mean, the cast was incredible to do the Brad Pitt to like come and shoot for six minutes in secret, like just about a hundred feet that way in the soundstage there, like after we'd finished shooting for three months or four months at that point. And, um, no, it was, it was amazing. It was just that, that sequence was so much fun for us. Do you have time to test it? Do you have time to show it to an audience? Or is that dangerous in this day and age where story will get out and you're yeah. going to be screwed? We never put Brad in, in there. That was oh, what but, we did. But any scene. But yeah, oh, yeah, you test, you, we test. I mean, we test here. It's like in this theater. It's, you know, you test and, and test and test. And what do you learn? And what comes in and what comes out? How do you make editorial changes through writing to solve things that may not be planned? Well, one of the things we do is we tape the audience. We audio tape their laughter, and then we, we can play it against picture and see where they laughed and didn't laugh. And, and because Deadpool's in a mask, and Juggernaut is a CG character, and Colossus is a CG character, and you can also obviously use traditional ADR, we can change jokes up until the movie comes out, as we were pointing out earlier. So 
you do refine the movie and you slowly figure out what's working and not, at least comedically. The rest of the things you have to kind of ask people after the fact, but it's a recursive process and it actually really works. I mean, the, the, the finished version was significantly better than the version we first put. And, and it's on. dangerous because you, you know, you'll find that the movies need to ebb and flow a bit, so you'll take something out where you think there's an ebb and, and you realize that it just, for some reason, has this domino effect later in the movie where you need that back. I don't, you know. But you guys look at and, you know, we are so involved in the process, you kind of lose perspective. Like, there was a big logic issue in Deadpool 1. People didn't really understand who Colossus was, where he came from, people who weren't comic guys. Like, and we had kind of glossed over that. We went back and reshot some stuff to, to kind of explain, you know, where he came from. And, and that was a huge help for us. We also always shoot the coda at the very, very end, after we've researched, screened it. So. So we had, we had already screened it a few times, and then we went back and shot this code, and we just thought it was kind of the perfect. It gives you the chance to really get the feel of the movie and the tone and what it's really missing at the end. And, and, uh, and so, yeah, that's always our last. That was a big show. debate, that whole coda at the end of the film, too, because uh, I think it was Dave Leach who said, what if we kept, somehow found some way to keep Vanessa alive? And, and you know, I remember he and I, like, it's like one of our only arguments, and I was like, you coward! You know, and then I thought, oh, wait, no, that's actually a good idea. What if we just uh, up the ante and just have some fun with the, the time travel? And then we all just dug in and started writing the Yeah, because originally, originally we had a coda where he was just interviewing a whole new bunch of X-Force people, and we were going to have various people come in, like Chris Evans was going to come in. And, uh, <laughs> as the human torch. As the human torch. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Also, we had one where, where Deadpool's like in the rain at a cemetery, and he's like pouring booze over the graves of each of his like fallen uh, X Force friends, and then first inexplicably gets to Shatterstar and urinates on his grave. I don't know. It's just like so stupid. And then and then Peter shows up with like missing one arm with just like that sort of old fashioned hook prosthetic, and uh, and yeah, it, I mean you 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 could fill a gymnasium with the amount of dumb ideas that we have. As we I mean the first the first pass of the sequel, we we had like one of the the I think it was the B plot was Deadpool trying to steal the the big red chair from the voice. <laughs> So dumb. You know, I wish I could have watched the studio reading that draft, going like, oh, hmm, but, uh, ooh, this is going to sink the ship. Yeah. But how do you create a space where you can throw out ideas like that? I mean, it seems like part of the success of Deadpool is that you don't tie yourselves down, that you're willing to do something as preposterous as that idea and see how far it goes. How do you make sure that you don't censor, censor yourself too early? Well, we never, I mean, the three of us, we, we sit around and, and just make each other laugh, and, and, uh, and that ultimately, you know, guides the process of, of what goes down on the page, so. Um, I don't know if that answered the question. It does. Where are you on uh, the next Deadpool film? Oh, uh, even vague. Well, we have some ideas. We have a script written. One script written that may or may or may, yeah, I think that's another one where the studio read it and go like, <laughs> we have to keep the rights to Fantastic Four. <laughs> oh God, what have they done? Um, uh, Paul just pitched a whole Deadpool 3 in the hallway outside before we walked in here. So that's a horse movie brewing too. Yeah. So there's a lot, of, a lot of ideas in the hopper. Yeah. And Ryan, last question. When you called the Academy a couple months ago and said, I've got this idea for best popular film, did you anticipate the backlash? Did that really catch you by surprise? Did it seem like a good idea at the time? Yeah, it really did, right? I mean, what the hell? Like, Rambo 9 stands no shot at this point. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's now, yeah, the, the old pocket. That lasted about 45 minutes, didn't it? Uh, a little bit longer, but oh, an hour and 15. Pretty sketchy, yeah. yeah so Red and I went out here. and got tuxedos and then had to return them. <laughs> You rented them, so true. We'll see you back here soon, I hope. So too. Ryan, Paul, Red. Thank you all for coming out.